If you felt like death was just around the corner, would you do anything different? Would you stop giving a damn about so many truly inconsequential things? This is not just some superficial self-help motivational speech. Rather, it allows us to get at what matters most to us. It opens our eyes to see our lives less constrained by the cares of others. And rather than be some derivative mode of thought, secondary to some supposed universal principles of reason, it is indeed the most fundamental truth of all. And without a sufficient consideration of it, we fail to see what serves as the very ground for every other kind of activity and mode of knowledge. Welcome to Back to the Text Themselves, a series on phenomenology. Today's video examines sections 53 to 57 of Heidegger's Being and Time. Previously, we considered how death is related to the three existentials that are grounded in care. In this video, Heidegger shows how being toward death manifests itself to Dasein in its entangled everydayness, and how that manifestation facilitates a modification in Dasein from an inauthentic to an authentic mode of being in the world. Rather than present a set of questions, I'm doing something different this time and instead drawing from a passage, using it to help unpack central ideas in the sections covered here. What is characteristic about authentic, existentially projected being toward death can thus be summarized as follows. Anticipation reveals to Dasein its lostness in the they-self and brings it face to face with the possibility to be itself, primarily unsupported by concern that takes care, but to be itself in passionate, anxious freedom toward death, which is free of the illusions of the they, factical, and certain of itself. When Dasein takes care of something ready to hand, it brings a being near to it, drawing closer to its possibilities. In doing so, it annihilates the possibility of the possible by rendering the innerworldly being as actual and available. Let's take up an example to make this clearer. My phone contains a host of possibilities. I can text, perform an internet search, and yes, I can even use my phone to call people. As I reach out to my phone and begin to use it, its functions no longer remain a possibility but are now an actuality. Those functions now being actualized then bring forth new possibilities that can in turn be actualized. I look up the address of some place I want to go, which then allows me to use my car to get there. Is death like this? Not really. Or if I do take care of death, drawing it from possibility into actuality, I bring about my demise, thereby depriving me of my existing as a being toward death. Additionally, one could, as Heidegger puts it, dwell near the end of one's possibility, meaning to constantly think about death. However, such ruminating over death in no way takes away from its possibility. If death is something to be related to, it must be in a very different mode than how one takes care of innerworldly beings. For this reason, being toward death is unsupported by concern that takes care. However, as we'll see, being toward death does make possible our taking care of things. Since being toward death cannot be related to in this mode of taking care, any authentic orientation toward death must be understood cultivated, and endured as a possibility. Whereas taking care weakens possibility by bringing it into actuality, our relation to death only strengthens and emphasizes its mode of appearance as possibility. Anticipation is this authentic mode of relating to the possibility of our being toward death. Though death for me is my nearest nearness, closer to me than I am to myself even, it's also as far removed as possible from anything real. Death is the possibility in which it becomes impossible for me to exist, to actualize any further possibilities. 
we might analogize it to how the speed of light is the absolute limit for the transmission of information in the physical universe, death functions phenomenologically like this as the absolute limit for my existence. When I anticipate my death, I approach it as what matters most to me, not only because it will happen to me, but because when I relate to death in the mode of anticipation, it has radical implications for everything around me right now, both in its actuality and possibility. Yet, death can only affect me in this way because it remains a pure possibility. It's more out of reach of the actual than any other possibility available to me, but as such can make all those other possibilities more available to me to actualize. Hence why being toward death is the condition of possibility for taking care of things. This anticipation of death in disclosing to us the extreme possibility of giving up ourselves has a way of shattering our entangled everyday existence and guards against being overtaken by what Heidegger calls the existence possibilities of others. Because death is my own most non-relational possibility, there always remains something that can never be taken over by the they. Of course, they may help me flee from this possibility to reinterpret it, yet at the end of the day, it will always be my death that marks the whole of my potentiality of being. This authentic anticipation of death wakes me up, tears me from the they, and individualizes me as the overwhelming potentiality of being that I always already am. Hence, anticipation reveals to Dasein its lostness, frees it from the illusion of the they, and brings it face to face with the possibility to be itself. This dimension of death made available to me by anticipation then discloses the truth of its certainty for me. This certainty is not like the certainty found uh, in objects or sense data. Instead, the immediate givenness of experience lags behind this certainty of anticipation. How is this the case? First, when it comes to any sort of sensory data from the external world, I'm far more able to doubt these immediate experiences than my own death. I can more readily imagine having mistaken a dream for reality than having been wrong about the certainty of death itself. Second, in thinking about the immediacy of consciousness or the ego, death is more fundamental to me, more constitutive of my being. The moment I was born and before I could even self-reflexively acknowledge myself as a thinking thing, I was already endowed with the certainty of death. As such, existentially speaking, the possibility of death precedes the immediacy of being a cogito. This certainty of death is matched only by its corresponding indefiniteness. I know not how nor when it will happen. I know not what other possibilities will be actualized before this final event transpires as I finally expire. I'm constantly threatened by this indefinite certainty of death, which discloses itself in the attunement of anxiety. In anxiety, I come face to face with the indefinite certainty of death. Anxiety, as opposed to fearful flight, is the authentic anticipation of our being toward death. Conscience gives us something to understand. It discloses. The they is characterized as a lostness of freedom and the possibilities of being as we are silently disburdened of choice. Anxiety tears us from this and toward the authentic potentiality of being oneself. However, we can ask, how does the modification from the they self to this authentic self happen? What initiates this modification? What are the ontological conditions that make such a modification possible. For this modification to take place, Dasein must first be shown to itself in its possible authenticity by having its potentiality for being a self attested to in a manner that allows Dasein to come back to itself. This attestation is called the voice of conscience. Conscience must not be understood as we typically understand it, 
this voice is not one of morality, social upbringing, and internalized superego. Instead, it is something fundamental to who we are by virtue of our existing. The conscience arrives to Dasein in its mode of the they self, disclosing to Dasein the lostness of its potentiality of being, but also the possibility of making up for not choosing and now deciding for one's potentiality of being to become an authentic self. The voice of conscience delivers this through the call. The call is a summoning to one's own most being guilty. We're going to be told much more about the meaning of this guilt in the next video, but briefly, Dasein is guilty for having foregone one's authentic potentiality of being. This guilt is not out of a sense of debt to another, but out of an indebtedness toward the authentic self of Dasein. And so we can now understand the quoted passage. Conscience gives to us our authentic potentiality of being, which discloses itself through a call and by which we can understand through our being guilty. Conscience reveals itself as the call of care. The caller is Dasein, anxious in thrownness, in its already being in, about its potentiality of being. The one summoned is also Dasein, called forth to its own most potentiality of being, in its already ahead of itself. And what is called the summons, out of falling prey to the they, already being together with the world taken care of, is Dasein. The call of conscience, that is, conscience itself, has its ontological possibility in the fact that Dasein, in the ground of its being, is care. Heidegger asks, who is the caller of this call? It's tempting to render the caller something familiar. God, the moral law within, society, or even one's parents. However, the call absolutely distances itself from any and all familiarity. It is properly speaking, nothing. But this nothingness of the caller has a very precise meaning for Heidegger here. To say the call is nothing is to say that it is no innerworldly being, that it lacks actuality, that it presents itself as neither objectively present nor ready to hand. The nothing refers to the domain of pure potentiality. If the present is equated with the totality of existing things in their actuality, then the unactualized future is literally no thing at all. So it's concluded that the caller is none other than Dasein itself, but Dasein in its own most potentiality of being, that is, in its nothingness. The one summoned is also Dasein, called forth to its own most potentiality of being. The caller calls Dasein from its having fallen prey and toward its own most potentiality of being. It reveals the disclosedness of Dasein in its thrownness, encountered through an anxiety that is directed at the uncanny nothingness of the world. It's a nothingness that is typically covered over, but nonetheless pursues Dasein and threatens its self-forgetful lostness. The disclosedness of our being there in our potentiality of being arrives through understanding and attunement. This understanding and attunement entails an owning of one's thrownness in projecting possibilities that are latent within it, and often covered over by the they. Inauthentic Dasein is the one who listens, but in listening to the they, it fails to hear its own self, the call of conscience. Now, I realize how this is sounding. It can strike the reader as odd and can be interpreted in an ontic manner as one part of the mind speaking to another part, as if there was some sort of split personality here. Of course, Heidegger means none of this. To put it in other words that hopefully won't cheapen the profundity of this thought, there is a version of myself in its unactualized potentiality. It's not a self that I currently am nor think I am. It's a self that, in fact, is nothing, no innerworldly being. In looking ahead, that self can disturb me, not so much for what I might become, but more so for how much I'm already giving up by not assuming possibilities that are available to me right now. Possibilities I've 
foregone for the sake of staying within the parameters for how others understand my possibilities. With this understanding of the caller and the called in mind, we can now more precisely describe the call itself. The call gives no information about the world. It says and gives nothing, no actual thing, but instead calls Dasein to itself in its own most unique, though indefinite, possibilities. The call of conscience delivers a jolt of an abrupt arousal that breaks up our listening to others and arouses another kind of hearing. From the position of my fallenness, it appears in the mode of the uncanny as an alien voice. The uncanny is the encounter with a world I no longer feel at home in. It's a situation whereby a strange and unfamiliar potentiality has broken through that world as I understood it through the public interpretedness of the they. This call in its uncanniness is Dasein's potentiality of being calling forth this fallen, inauthentic Dasein out of its complacency and toward an authentic mode of being. That authentic mode entails Dasein taking care of things in a manner that more fully projects its possibilities. As such, what the call calls for is care. Dasein is defined as care in the ground of its being. And if care entails a being ahead of oneself while already being in a world and being with others in that world, then what Dasein calls itself to is a more authentic mode of taking care of things. We might say then that the call, in pointing us toward the future, leads to a modified relationship with our present and past such that we take care of things in a manner that is no longer dictated by the limitations of the they. We must keep in mind that the wholeness of Dasein's potentiality of being is found in death. It is by anticipating death that breaks us free from the constraints of the they. It is out of this being toward death that Dasein calls forth inauthentic Dasein. The call arrives in anxiety out of the uncanniness of the world because it is, in a sense, our death or the possibility of it, that is shocking us out of our complacency. I want to thank the following for supporting this channel on Patreon. If you wish to support this work on Patreon, the link is below in the description. You can also support this work by liking and sharing this video and subscribing to my channel. And as always, thank you for watching, and until next time, be well.